Good afternoon, YouTube. Today I'm coming to you from a beautiful rooftop deck in Jacksonville, Florida on a little vacation. And you know, one of the things I've been wanting to do for a long time, it's been a goal of mine, is to go and visit the Cornell and Dill factory. And I finally got the chance to do so. And when I got out there, I was able to sit down with the VP of manufacturing as well as the head blender. And those guys were amazing. I was expecting, you know, maybe a half hour of their time. They ended up giving me an hour and a half. Uh, they took me on a tour of the factory, and then I was able to sit down and do a one-on-one -on -one interview. Uh, it, was, it was awesome. So if you have any questions on this video, definitely let me know. Uh, either shoot me a PM or put them down below and I'll respond. I'm also going to post some pictures on Instagram, so check that out. And let me know if you like this one. Um, it was a lot of fun for me. So this is probably the most fun I had in a long time. I'm going to start off the video with a little bit of prep work I did. Uh, then we'll get right to it. So I hope you like this one. And again, thanks guys. Appreciate all your support. So it's Saturday night here in Raleigh, and it's two days before my trip to Cornell and Deal. And to prepare myself, I decided to give myself kind of like a homework assignment. I decided to only smoke c &D blends for the next two days so that I can kind of develop questions I want to ask Chris about some of my favorite blends. Now when I get out there, I'm going to be like a kid in a candy factory. The reality is, I'm going to be an adult in a tobacco factory. But to me, they're basically the same thing. It's not a bad place to be. Now to get out there, and it is in the middle of nowhere, uh, Morgantown, North Carolina. Uh, but to get out there, it is kind of a trek. Uh, you have to basically dedicate a, a good chunk of your vacation just to go visit the place. But to me, it's worth it. And the reason why is because over the last year or so, you know, I've really developed a connection with some of these C&D blends, and some of my friends have too. And to be honest, you know, I wasn't a big Cornell & Deal fan uh, when I first started smoking a pipe, but once you're hooked, you're hooked. And I'll be honest, I'm hooked. Um, some of my favorite blends are C&D blends. Uh, Burley Flake number three is what I'm smoking right now. And there's something about what they produce that really connects with me. Uh, a certain rawness to a lot of the blends. Of course, I'm kind of partial to the Burleys, but I've had a variety of their blends. They, they all just have that punch to them that really let you know you're smoking something. And I really appreciate that. So, I'm really excited about this trip. It's going to be a lot of fun. Good morning, YouTube. So, it's about two hours before my trip to the factory. I wanted to wake up early, uh, go over my questions just to be prepared. And I was going through the hotel just a second ago. I started thinking of some of you guys out there that might want to make the trek out here, but would have a hard time convincing the family to do so. So, a lot of hotels have those, those big racks of brochures about all the touristy things you can do uh, in that town. I didn't find that here, but I did find two. And although I wouldn't really call them tourist attractions, uh, I think it's the best we're gonna have to work with here. So the first one is Denny's. Now, I know it's not a tourist attraction, but Denny's is a, well, it's a staple of Americana. And if you have family members who love Denny's or just love a, a, a nice buffet, or an affordable buffet, then you might have something here. And the second one, again, not really a tourist attraction. Uh, it's a brochure of coupons, but one of the coupons is for zip lining. So if you have family members who like to zip line and would like to do so for as low as $39, then Morganton may have something to offer. Maybe you could actually even do a package deal. You could go zip lining first and then go to Denny's. It's kind of like a reward. All right, so the entrance to Cornell and Deal is just 100 feet here in front of me. And I'm gonna show it to you because it really is unassuming. It's very small. Let me just grab this here. It's just a small country lane road on a residential street. And they got a little sign out there that says Cornell and Deal. This is the driveway. And here's the building. Very small, very small. Just a single building, the blue awning. Just a couple cars here. All right, so let's go in. I'm excited. All right. So this is the, the main room. Yep, this is the actual plant. Also the only room. Right. <laughs> the big one. Right. Okay. Um, 
Oh, wow. We are in the process of stripping some, some bright leaves right now. Okay. Um, all of our... These are Virginias or yeah, this, this is... Yeah, Bright Virginia. Bright Virginia, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. All of our raw tobaccos come in and get stored right here. Okay. So we you know, take the center stems out of them. So they come that way and then you open them up and... Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Basically stem it by hand. Very uh, cool. Each one of these boxes is about 440 pounds. So wow. That all gets handled from the get-go. And where does this come from? Is this a variety of different fields? Well, in I mean, the, the, area? the Turkish tobaccos come from Turkey. Okay. Um, most, of the, uh, most of the red Virginias come from the U.S. Our bright Virginia, this comes from Canada. Canada? Mm -hmm. Really? What, mm -hmm. uh, what province? I, I'm not sure. Do you know? Or is it several different ones? I mean, I would imagine that it's it's crops across okay. across Canada. Um, that's the way the tobacco is handled in the U.S. That, you Do know, you buy it from distributors then in yeah. the middle? Okay, yeah. so they yeah. have their own connections with all the farms. And, that's right. Okay, that's right. I didn't know they grew tobacco that far north. That's amazing. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is the box opening here. Yep. Raw okay. tobacco comes in here. And then from here, it goes upstairs. Okay. We I'll moisten it. We moisten it here so that we can we can cut it without it turning to dust. If it's dry and you try and cut it, it's just gonna break apart. So once the back of gets stripped and cut, then it moves up to to this area. Oh wow. And goes on to drying rack. So what are we looking at right here? This is, is this dark burly? Dark burly. Okay. Uh, you can feel there's a little, little moisture yet in this. So it'll probably be another day before this is ready to go. Okay. So uh, about a day, day and a half to dry. Uh, yeah, this has been up here over the weekend actually because okay. of all the rain. We it just took a lot, a lot right. longer to dry. Okay. So uh, is it arranged by type? So this is all burly, and that's all. Of, all of these are burly. All of them are burly. Yeah. Okay. We try and we try and keep like thing. I mean, we have we'll do 440 pounds of crack, so we try and do all of it at once. You oh, know? this is your burly run. Yeah. And then it'll be a Virginia run. Yeah, that's okay. right. Now when so we, we we'll start over here again. So that's the opening up of the boxes and right, drying it out. Tobacco. Uh, stripping. Sorry. Um, and then the tobacco will be moistened. And covered up with a covered up with a tarp, and left overnight to kind of uh, even out. Right there, yep. in that side. Okay. And then it will go into the big cutter right behind Ben there. Okay. Uh, and that's that's how we cut all of this into into ribbon. Much like that. Well, that's burly, like but yeah. This. Okay. And then it'll come up here, spread out on screens to dry. Okay. Um, after it gets dried. Then it gets moved into boxes, just like you see behind the blending table here, and then put into, into stock rotation. So when when Ted and William are making blends there, uh, they're using they're pulling from those boxes. They're basically. pulling from okay. those boxes. So kind of a three-step process: bam, upstairs, dry, right, cut, and then right to the boxes. Right. Okay. So then there, everything gets blended dry so that you can easily intermingle things. Like okay. A lot of people don't think about that, but when you blend, if, you don't you've, want got, if you've got wet tobacco, it's just gonna stick together in clumps and right. you're not going to get a unified mixture. So, so you do everything dry, and then afterwards you add your moisture. Okay. Um, and is that moisture adding process in the tin or way way upstream? That's at the blending tin. Oh, it's right there. Yep. Okay. And is it sprayed on? Like uh, literally with a bottle? It or? is. Uh, it is applied just drips and then and then mix it through it up. and take a reading on a on a hygrometer and see where you're at. And add more if you need to. Let it air out for a few minutes if you need to. Basically, we're shooting for like 18% on our loose blends and more like 25% on our flakes. Okay. It's just like cooking. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yep. Okay. Is that a flake machine or a press? This is one of our presses, yes. So, that's the big press. That's a 90 ton. That white one there? Yeah. Okay. 90 ton swing press. And basically what happens is uh, you, you put an eight pound block portions of any particular plate or plug that you're making right. with, uh, with plates in between them to separate them and then 
what's here is being pressed. Can you swing that out just one more time? Sure. So you just fill that to the brim with tobacco? Well, we do eight pound portions. Okay. Um, and with plates like this in between. Uh, About so, every inch or so or? Well, you'd weigh eight pounds in. Okay. Even it out, put a plate on top. On top, okay. Put your next eight pounds in and you can fit three gotcha. eight okay. pound blocks in here and then when you raise the plunger, this thing pulls 110 tons of pressure. Oh, so it's going so, up, not yeah, going down. it's going okay. up. And then you've got another compartment here that you can be filling while this is pressing. Some things press for two hours, some things press for 45 minutes. Okay. Um, and then from there, they come out, this thing swings around, what you put in here goes under pressure, what you just took out comes out with the jack gets wrapped into parchment paper. And it's just rock solid at that point? It's... Yeah, it's pretty solid. Yeah. And then it comes over to the next step of the pressing process, 40 ton, 40 ton press. Okay. So it goes from, it goes from the heavy, heavy press. To a lighter press. To a lighter press okay. um, for longer. So gotcha. it'll hold in this for a day. And then it comes out, and if it's a flake, um, it goes into the smaller presses that we walked past when we were in the entryway, the little presses that were on the side. Did you see those? Yeah. Those are 12 ton presses. As a and, third step. Then. Yeah. Okay. So a flake will go from the 90 ton to the 40 ton to the 12 ton for two weeks. Okay. Pressing the process. This is where we actually cut it into flakes. Then it goes onto trays over here to dry. Oh yeah. What's, uh, what batch is this right here? Uh, looks like we've got some gaslight here. Uh, that's all we've got going right that's now. That's gaslight right there. Yeah. Okay. Looks like brownies. Yeah, it does. So he didn't sell us right? No, I didn't touch him. I, that's why I told him to get you before you did sell Then, this is where tobacco actually gets put into tens. And you can see every step of this process for yeah. his hand. Right. Uh, you know, she's she's cutting crumble cakes. Uh, what is that bourbon blue? Yep. So one of our one of our new new oh, offerings. And this is this is stock that has been pressed, vacuum sealed. Um, that's what they're opening up and cutting into two ounce bars and then portioning into ten. Gotcha. Okay. Very cool. Well, should we go in the front? Make sure. it. Uh, Ask you the 10 questions. Okay. Cornell Deal has been in operation for 23 years now. Okay. Uh, we've been in this plant uh, in Western North Carolina for nine years. And you're getting ready to move in just a few weeks? Uh, yes, we're actually, uh, the last truck brings the heavy cutters and stuff, we'll be leaving here on the 18th of May. Wow. So uh, it's coming down to the push time. Okay. So the first question I had was, a lot of people are very curious about this, where does your tobacco come from? It comes from all over. Um, it comes from, we get our Bright Virginia from Canada, we get our Red Virginia right here from North Carolina, we get our Burleys from Kentucky, uh, we get our Latakia from Cyprus, we get, uh, from the island of Cyprus, we get our Parique from St. James Parish in Louisiana. Um, we get our dark fired burley from um, Kentucky as well. Um, we get our black Cavendish from Virginia. Okay. Uh, also, a lot of people are curious if Perique is getting more scarce, or has it become more scarce over the last couple of years? No, actually, it's increased. Increased in okay. in amount. Um, there's two gentlemen that, there's two types of Perique. There's an Acadian Perique, mm -hmm. which is a pure Perique, and there's very small amounts of that. It only comes from one farm in St. James Parish, and that gets sold to one client, American Spirit Cigarettes, for their Perique cigarettes. I've seen those, yeah. The other type of Perique is a St. James Perique from St. James Parish, and that is made by one man, and he has a big operation down there, and he it, makes a lot of it. 
and he can supply basically the whole industry. With they have they a consortium of farms. He has about eight or nine farms that grow the burley, and then he creates the perique and the barrels at his factory. Yet. Okay. So perique actually is burley starting out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. Um, obviously, you have a lot of big fans out there, um, mm -hmm. especially just in, in my little world, which is the YouTube community. But I'm curious, what are some of the, the best letters of appreciation you ever received? Best letters of appreciation have been um, from, believe it or not, have been from sometimes from wives of customers who have said mm. that my husband is finally smoking something that I can enjoy in the house as opposed to having to throw him out in the garage or the back porch or <laughs> on the tractor when he does his chores. That is a great story. So uh, that's the kind of thing we get the most of. Uh, we get a lot of thank you for getting me into the right blend kind of letters mm -hmm. and notes and emails. Um, that type of thing is what we generally get. Okay. So I've gotten some some uh, emails from customers who actually had gone so far as to draw graphs of the things that I had suggested and how they how they worked out for them and their tasting notes and all of this. One guy in particular that is is really got a a, a very very detailed Excel spreadsheet that is how he organizes his whole cellar and like. <laughs> and was thanking you for making recommendations. Yeah. Wow, that is amazing. Um, the next question is about particular blends. Uh, roughly how many blends would you say you make right now? With all the lines we offer, we're at about 200, 200 individual yeah. blends, yeah. So in, any given, in any given month, you may produce up to 150 of those actively? Yes, actively, yes. Okay. And out of all those, I'm, I'm curious, what's, blend, what's a blend you've launched um, in the last, say, five years that you've been really surprised with how it connected with the audience, with the customers out there, and really just got really popular um, above and beyond your expectations? A couple. Um, the uh, Nutty Irishman that we make in Aromatic, we do that on a Cavendish-like Cavendish base. Mm -hmm. That was very popular. It's been very popular in stores. We sell a lot of that to stores um, who you know put it in jars for their customers, mm -hmm. and they might rename it or you know whatever. But right. um, that's been real popular. I didn't think that was going to be a big hit, and that was one of the first ones I ever developed. So that was that was actually the first blend I ever developed. So that was pretty popular. It's a little longer than five years. That's about eight years now. But it's um, a good way to start. You're one for one. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, and you're always surprised at the blends that you think are gonna do well f at first, but then don't, but mm -hmm. then two years later they take traction and then they go crazy. Briar Fox is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. It's our best selling Virginia. It probably took two years to get on the market, and this was 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it got real popular. It didn't get real popular in a hurry, but then after two years it got real popular, and now it is always popular. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the difference was about two years ago, what the catalyst was? No, just after two years on the market, it just started to take off. It's one of those things. I mean, sometimes things sell right away, and sometimes and they fizzle out, and mm -hmm. they go steady, or sometimes they just start heavy and keep going heavy, and sometimes it just takes them a while to get traction. Okay. So Now i got to be a little biased and ask you some personal questions about my favorite blends. Mm -hmm. um, so the Burley Flakes, one mm -hmm. through four. Uh, first of all, which one would you say sells the most? Which, which one's the most popular? One. One is the most popular. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the least would be? Four. Four. Mm -hmm. That's almost almost exactly the opposite of what, what I would have mm -hmm. expected. Um, my favorite is number three. And three I, is probably the second is most it? popular, yeah. I discovered it several months ago, and it just grabbed a hold of me and hasn't let go since. So you're and then for a, a good friend of mine, a, a long YouTube, long time YouTube presenter, Matches Eight Six Zero, uh, he's been a long time uh, haunted bookshop lover, mm -hmm. uh, which has been challenging for some of us other guys. Um, and he was really curious the the big difference or the biggest difference between that and Old Joe Krantz in terms of proportions. I know it's basically the same ingredients. Can you talk a little bit about those two? Haunted bookshop has a little more red Virginia in it. Okay. And a little less white burling in it. So it tends to be a little sweeter than old Joe Kranz is. Mm -hmm. um, that's the general, that's the basic difference of it. Well, and vastly increased amounts per week. Yes, and vastly increased amounts per week, yes. It's a little sweeter that way. So Okay. If somebody was just really in love with Haunted Bookshop, uh, besides old Joe Kranz, what's another recommendation that you think, out of your 200 blends here, that maybe they wouldn't even know about uh, because it's relatively new, that you would point them in the direction of? Five o'clock shadow. Five o'clock shadow. Um, Oak Alley would be another one. Oak Alley would, would be a great one. one. I'd put them into. Okay. Um, both of those. 
uh, next question. Uh, what would you say is your most, and it, maybe it's a it's a 200 weight tie, but what would you say is your most difficult blend to make, either because the ingredients are hard to get or because the, the blending itself is more challenging or more time consuming? Is, is there a handful of blends out there that are just, take a lot more time to make and a lot more, uh, it's a lot more challenging to make? I would probably say autumn evening would be our most challenging just autumn because of the time it takes to make. Yep. It's a, all, all told, it can be up to a five-day process. And why is that? What, what's unique about autumn evening? Well, we make our own River Virginia Cavendish so the tobacco is cooked first, mm. and then it's sauced while wet. And hot. And hot. Sauced S- meaning? Like the sauce is added, the maple flavoring is added to oh, it when, okay. it's, when it's hot and wet okay. and soaking wet. So it, it instead of being a casing, it's actually infused. The flavor, the tobacco exudes the water and sucks up the flavor as it dries. So Whereas your other aromatics are, are, are more cased. Gotcha. Okay. Right. And it's just the, it's the actual drying time that takes the longest of that. Okay. Um, in terms of quality control or how to, you know, the challenges of trying to make a consistent blend week after week, month after month, year after year, uh, what is your, your secret here to making as best you can, you know, a tin of Burley Flake number three tastes today like it did last year. Picking the right tobaccos that match what we've been using for years. Mm. So color not necessarily is what we're after. Sugar content, nicotine content, taste is what we're after. Do you do, is there like a taster here that lights a bowl up before you take a batch in or anything like that? That would be both of us. Okay. <laughs> right so, from the raw leaf that we saw? Yeah. Or really? Yeah, raw leaf or from ribbon form. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm curious what that tastes like. Um, and Jeremy has, Jeremy's fairly new here. He's only been with us for about five months now, but um, he'll get used to this. If we have to change tobaccos, in other words, if a year changes or something like that, if we've run out of a particular type of tobacco from our supplier, like a Red Virginia that we've been using right mm-hmm. now, we're using a very old 2003 case, which is beautiful to use. But if we run out of that and we have to find another Red Virginia, then we get samples and we start tasting. Okay. So it's a little different tasting raw tobacco than it is tasting... Process. process, right, right. Then it is tasting process to that. It's harsher, a little, a little harsher. Okay. You got it, and you really you're after a whole note taste spectrum because you really what you're after is not only how it tastes, but that sugar content and the nick content. Right, right. Because that's what really changes the tobacco flavor in a pipe tobacco. So, like, we're a cigarette. If you're making Marlboros, any Burley is going to work. But if you're making Old Joe Crants, not any Burley works. If we get a particular stringent batch. If we're not paying attention and we get a bad batch of white burley or something like that, we can't use something that's got a real high, it inherently has a high nicotine content. You just don't want something that's way over the top because it will change the flavor and the composition of the tobacco mm, very okay. quickly. Okay. And the smokeability. <laughs> yeah, and the smokeability, yeah. Uh, just two more questions. Uh, next one is, and this is, this is kind of funny, so I came into town last night, uh, stayed at a hotel, and... In kind of anticipation for this little trip here, I just asked probably four or five people around town, have they heard of Cornell and Deal? And nobody has. Right. You guys are definitely flying under the radar here. Yes. Is it, do you find that unusual? I found unusual unusual because, you know, me and the, the group that I kind of belong to, this is the only reason we know this town. And yet all the other people in the town don't know you guys are here. Right. You know, part, there's two reasons for that. One is we are located outside of town. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you saw when you come up, we are in the middle of the you know, a rural area here. Right. So uh, that's one of the things. And the other one is we're not a retail seller, so we don't, you know, we don't have a shop open or, you know, people don't come in here to buy tobacco. Mm-hmm. And there's you not know. even a pipe shop in town. Well, there, yeah, there's tobacco barns, but, you know, that sell pipes, but, you know, the lower end. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that would be the biggest reason. In other words, you can walk around town and not feel like superstars. You don't have a lot of people coming no. up. And, okay. No. no. I was expecting to see banners around town saying support Cornell and Deal. Yeah, right. Welcome no, to no, no, no. home yeah. of Cornell see and Deal. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, um, so I want to ask you guys, what are some of your favorite blends? If you had to choose just one or two. Hmm. Exhausted Rooster. This is in no particular order. Yeah. Exhausted Rooster. Apricots and cream, Oak Alley, um, Epiphany. Um, 
Well, that's three. That's all you get. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Almost exclusively here recently, I've been smoking Heritage, which is uh, from the Two Friends series, okay. the Two Friends line. Um, Ed, it's awesome. Uh, I don't usually smoke exclusively uh, that way. Like I don't, I don't find one blend and just smoke it. So it's particularly remarkable that Heritage has become like the only tin I need to travel with. Um, I do smoke a lot of Ocali. Uh, I also really like Five O'clock Shadow quite a bit. Mm. Um, Those three get the they'll, they'll get the job done basically. Yeah. Right. And then I actually just saw a, a tin of uh, GLPs in there, so I wanted to ask you. We manufacture all of Craig Pease's tobaccos. All of them, and okay. we have for years. Is yeah. that a is that a uh, is it any different than any different of a process than your own lines, or is it? No, it's, it's seamless, the same tobacco, seamless, seamless integration. Seamless integration. Recipes are different. He develops the recipes. Okay. He's like an author, like a very popular author in this case, like a Tom Clancy or right. um, Patricia Cornwall. He's a, that, so he'll write the proportions down. He writes the proportions people. down. We develop, we manufacture the blend, send him a sample. He says it's a go, and it's a go, and we start producing. Gotcha. Okay. So, I did it, not know that. And he's using the same component mix. I mean, the component blends that, uh, sorry, blending components. That's right. what I'm trying to say. He's using the same tobaccos that we are in our own blends. And okay. Same for the Costello line and for Two Friends. And, and for uh, Captain Earl series. Is it fair to say your your volume or your sales in any given year are higher than the year before? That's Always. It? Yeah. Yeah. We had uh, between Wait. 14 and 13, we had a 56% increase in production amount. Wow. So in manufacturing of any kind, that's unheard of. Right. So, and, and the key to your success, uh, or the, the key to your uh, expansion, I guess, um, can you point to any one or two things, or is it really organic? It's been a lot of people, a lot of different things we put fingers on in mm -hmm. the last 23 years. My father and mother started this company 23 years ago. Uh, when my dad was in Pennsylvania, he wanted a retirement business, and he bought the whole the equipment that was available, the flavors, the recipes, for about $17,000. And the mm -hmm. first year, he did $17,000 worth of sales. So um, it grew from there. Um, they moved down to North Carolina. Uh, it grew from where they were in their house to this facility. Uh, a lot of that had to do with my dad's marketing public relations background mm. and my mother on the phone. Um, they started to hire more people. Uh, and then the merger came along with Ladizi, and that helped as well. So it's been one thing after another. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of people in the fingers in the pot to get it to this point. Right. right. So, um, Well, Chris and Jeremy, I want to thank you for your time. Absolutely. Appreciate it. I know you guys know this already, but you have a lot of big fans out there. Well, and, thank you. Um, we just we love your product, so well, keep making you. it. Thank Appreciate you very much. All right. Thanks, guys.